Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the memorial of St. John Vianney, the patron of parish priests. It's a wonderful day for all of us parish priests because we look to John Vianney as that really having the heart of Jesus, that person having the heart of Jesus. It's a beautiful, beautiful feast today. Unfortunately, it's a rainy day. I mean, Michael, row your boat ashore. Tell me about it. I mean, this is like unbelievable. Be careful out there. Be careful out there. And anyone who is vacationing at the Jersey Shore as well, be very careful. Don't go out. Just stay in with your air condition. Read, pray, do a puzzle, you know, things like that. Well, today I want to continue our series of marriage. And we, yesterday we talked about the consent. But before the consent, remember we mentioned about the questioning, the priest questioning the couple about the spiritual goods of marriage. Remember that? I love that. And those questions are very, very, very important. So before the consent, the priest asks, and we'll go over that really quickly, Joseph and Mary, have you come here to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? Is anyone forcing you? Because that's an interesting question. Sometimes people are forced to get married. Not a good thing. Second question. Are you prepared as you follow the path of marriage to love and honor each other exclusively for as long as you both shall live? Are you prepared to accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? The procreation and education of children. And then after that, we go into the vows or what we call the consent. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love and to honor you all the days of my life. And remember I said, the church gives us the vows. We cannot make up our own vows. They have to be very specific and precise. Okay? And so they're the vows. And then after the vows or the consent, the priest receives them, and it's called the reception of the consent. Don't you love all these words? the reception of the consent. May the Lord in his kindness strengthen the consent you both have declared before the church and graciously bring to fulfillment his blessing within you. What God joins together, let no one put asunder. Isn't that beautiful? I love all this. I guess you could tell because I always say, isn't that beautiful? Because I enjoy the liturgy of the church. Then the blessing and giving of rings. Remember I told you it was only the woman received the ring because he married her. He received her. He welcomed her into his home. Well, that comes from a tradition of small t where that usually happened. The guy, the provider, in many ways, and he would betroth her, welcome her, let her come into his own home, provide for her. Now the rings are given to each. The bride is receiving a ring from the groom, and the groom is receiving a ring from the bride. Beautiful. May the Lord bless these rings which you will give to each other as a sign of love and fidelity. And then when they place the ring on the left hand, which is, this is my left, okay, the left hand. Receive this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And remember I told you yesterday, the left hand, that's of the world. The right would be more transcendent. And you would see the bride and the groom receiving the ring on the left hand because marriage ends with death, right? So it's for this world. Where in holy orders, it is for eternity. So if a priest or a bishop wears a ring, it is on the right hand. 
and I just want you to be aware of that. Sometimes I do look. I'll see uh, where people have their hand, where their rings are. And I know that if somebody wears a ring on their right hand, I know it's not a wedding band. I know it's not a wedding band because the wedding band would be always around the left hand, around the left finger of the left hand, this hand. And I just look at them and I, and I just think of the ring too as a symbol of God. No beginning and no end, right? That God has joined this marriage together that God has placed his seal on this couple for marriage, to be a reflection of Christ's marriage to the church. And then after that, you know, they are married. Does it necessarily have to be rings exchanged? Not necessarily. In order for the sacrament to take place, five people, bridegroom, two witnesses, and the priest or deacon. And for the sacrament to take place, baptized male, baptized female, right? And then the exchange of vows or the consent. The priest witnesses the consent on behalf of the church and the other two witnesses witness it on behalf of the community. And there you have it. So within the nuptial mass, it happens right after the homily. Within the nuptial ceremony, it happens right after the homily as well. But you have to know there's a difference between a nuptial ceremony and a nuptial mass. Now, in both cases of the nuptial mass and the nuptial ceremony, there is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is prayed. And after the Lord's Prayer, the couple kneels down for a nuptial blessing. And I want you to listen to the nuptial blessing because I find it very beautiful, very packed with meaning. The priest extends his hands over the couple behind the altar. So the priest is standing at the altar, not in front of the altar, but like he is for Mass, whether that be Mass or a ceremony. And then the couple kneels and he extends his hands over the couple because why? What flows from the altar, it's Christ. Remember, Christ is present. And what flows from the altar extends to them because all the graces are always from the altar always from the altar. The blessings are an extension of that. And then this nuptial blessing, as Christ has married his bride, the church, so he extends to this couple, the nuptial blessing. So let's hear it. Dear brothers and sisters, let us humbly pray to the Lord that on these his servants, now married in Christ, he may mercifully pour out the blessing of his grace and make of one heart in love and if they received communion by the sacrament of Christ's body and blood those he has joined by a holy covenant then we pray in silence then the priest with his hands extended over the bride and groom says this O God who by your mighty power created all things out of nothing and when you have set in place the beginnings of the universe, form man and woman in your own image, making the woman an inseparable helpmate to the man, that they might no longer be two but one flesh. And taught what you were pleased to make one must never be divided. O God, who consecrated the bonds of marriage by so great a mystery, that in the wedding covenant you foreshadowed the sacrament of Christ and his church. See, the covenant you foreshadowed between Christ and his church. Are you, are you picking up all these words? What the church prays? Remember, lex orande, lex credende, lex vivendi. O God, by whom woman is joined to man, 
and the companionship they had in the beginning is endowed with the one blessing not forfeited by original sin nor washed away in the flood. Look now with favor on these your servants, joined together in marriage, who ask to be strengthened by your blessing. Send down on them the grace of the Holy Spirit and pour your love into their hearts that they may remain faithful in the marriage covenant. Don't you love that word covenant? It's a spiritual relationship. May the grace of love and peace abide in your daughter and let her always follow the example of the holy women whose praises are sung in the scriptures. May her husband entrust his heart to her so that acknowledging her as his equal and his joint heir to the life of grace, he may show her due honor and cherish her always with the love that Christ has for the church. And now, Lord, we implore you, may these your servants hold fast to the faith and keep your commandments, made one in the flesh. May they be blameless in all they do and with the strength that comes from the gospel. May they bear true witness to Christ before all May they be blessed with children and prove themselves virtuous parents who live to see their children's children and grant that reaching at last together the fullness of years for which they hope they may come to the life of the blessed in the kingdom of heaven through Christ our Lord. Amen. Can you see so many of these in these words the implication of the theology of marriage did you hear in this prayer the spiritual goods of marriage? Did you hear in the prayer that the two become one in the flesh? See, that's part of the conjugal love. Did you know that? That the two become one in the flesh? Because the two are joined as one in the conjugal act. It's a whole giving of oneself, not only physically, but also spiritually and emotionally. They become one. Because from that oneness, see, they don't do it on their own, their own. That's why anything outside of the conjugal act to have a child would be immoral. It's not part of the plan of God. Like, in other words, test two babies, in vitro fertilization, all that cannot be done. Can you see how the two become one? See, these are not just nice words or hallmark cards. Like I always say, this is not a, this is not a hallmark card. This is theology. This is what the church believes. Lex orande, lex vivendi, lex orande, that's what we pray. Lex vivendi, what we believe. Lex vivendi, of what we live. So the law of prayer is what we believe. So I have to find out, if we're praying this, that means we must believe in it. It must not be a hallmark card. And what we believe is how we live. Did you notice this also? O oh God, by whom woman is joined to man, and the companionship they had in the beginning is endowed with the one blessing, not forfeited by original sin, nor washed away by the flood. What does that tell you? Divine law. Nothing will pass through that. Not forfeited by original sin, nor washed away by the flood. Divine, God's divine law his marriage is his divine law. Can you see everything that we were talking about in this whole series is beautifully captured in the nuptial blessing? I love it. I love it. So, again, we look at this prayer for the spiritual goods of marriage. Permanent. Indissoluble. Procreative. All this wonderful, wonderful love. This love that God has bestowed upon the, not only an earthly love, it's a transcendent love that you are to reflect His love to the world as a married couple. I mean, people look to the priest in their vows and what they mean. We look to the married couples in their vows and what they mean. O oh God, who consecrated the bond of marriage by so great a mystery, 
See, Jesus consecrated the bonds of marriage at the wedding feast sacramentally, but God the Father consecrated marriage from the very beginning in divine law. So it's from the beginning. From the very beginning. That's why every marriage is consecrated. So when I, when, remember when I said to you that if a Lutheran marries a Lutheran, it's a valid marriage? And an annulment must be given if they divorce and want to remarry again. Because it's a valid union. So, O oh God, who consecrated the bond of marriage by so great a mystery, that in the wedding covenant you foreshadowed the sacrament of Christ's marriage to the church. Beautiful. I also like the words that I talked to you about, that they might no longer be two, but one flesh. Hmm. So it's not just like a, uh, oh, it's nice that, you know, aren't they? They're a nice couple. They're now, they're now one. But no, it's like they're one flesh. What does that mean, that they're one flesh? You know, the two become one. It's like Christ and the church. Christ is one with us. He's just not out there floating somewhere. He's one with us. And where does Christ, where does the church give birth? At the font. At the font. New life is given at the font. The church gives birth at the font. Isn't that beautiful? That's the marriage. The marriage of Christ and his church. And the church gives birth at the font. Married couples, the two of them become one in the conjugal act. And life is given by a gift from God to them. Love all that, everyone. May her husband entrust his heart to her, so that acknowledging her as his equal and as joint heir to the life of grace, he may show her due honor and cherish her always with the love that Christ has for his church. There is a, a special bond between the husband and wife that the husband really is a protector as well and a joint heir to the life of grace. In other words, they have to help each other get to heaven. You know, they say when men practice their Catholic faith, it's most likely that the children will when they're adults. Sorry, women. I mean, I, I don't want to downplay your role because your role is so unbelievable in the family life. But they say when it comes to the practice of the faith, if the father prayed and went to Mass every Sunday, it's more likely that the kids will go. Interesting. Interesting. That father figure has a lot of symbolism in it, doesn't it? So that happens right after the Our Father. And Mass will continue on, and the ceremony will continue on in its order of the actual nuptial ceremony. So I think after the nuptial blessing, then uh, what will happen is there will be a blessing for all the people and a dismissal. But in the Mass, what would happen is then Mass will go on with the sign of peace, the Lamb of God, the distribution of Holy Communion, the prayer after communion, the final blessing, and the dismissal. I don't want to get too technical with you, but people always get confused. Father, what's the difference between a nuptial mass and a nuptial ceremony? A mass is a mass. A ceremony is a ceremony, a little ceremony. But it's not the mass. So, just wanted to give you kind of a background of all of that. Now, the next time when we meet, we're going to talk about annulments. Because I want to talk to you about what is an annulment? 
and the sadness in when a couple no longer can stay married. How does the church respond to that? Okay? Well, enjoy this quiet day inside on the memorial of St. John Marie Vianney, the cure of ours, of ours, friends. You have heard of that place, ours, friends, where he really was the saint of the confessional, at least 12 hours a day in the confessional. God bless St. John Vianney, and may all parish priests, including this one, always look to him as an inspiration and help. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you.